on our quest to understand the food system and prosperity, it's led me to look at the chicken industry, especially here in Arkansas with Tyson being at the core of that. And so I reached out to a Tyson biographer, Marvin, and had him come tell us a lot about uh, some history I wasn't quite expecting, but it was really, really good information. And then one of my dear friends, Shane, who is a Tyson grower, and just kind of a, a deeper dive into that industry, what it's like, and then, you know, what maybe we can do. So enjoy the little sit down and some Arkansas history with some Titans. All right, Marvin, I'm I'm so excited to have uh, this conversation. It's a really interesting story of how we even got here, though. Uh, your book was recommended to me years ago. I bet I bet it was close to a decade that uh, I, I have read the book and and known about your work. Um, from a friend of mine that is a, a chicken grower, but there's a big Atkins connection. That's that's where we're from, and then uh, the it, it's just it's just neat seeing how it all ties together. But we uh, were talking and tried to get this little project going to understand chicken and farming and agriculture and and how things are done versus how I I would love to see things go, and so. I feel like we really need to understand the history of it. So I reached out to you uh, as as the author and biographer of, of Don Tyson, a lot of that that you've done, uh, just to kind of get your perspective on you know a lot of things. But how how did you get to Arkansas? Because I'm surprised that you weren't you weren't native, but you're here. Well, I'm here. I've been here since '71, Logan, and it's been a, a lifetime of great opportunity. Um, I think that happens sometimes when you're an outsider and you have some confidence and skill, doors open up. And they certainly did for me, and I've really had an extraordinary career. I came here to go to graduate school at Fayetteville. I already have an uh, undergraduate and a master's degree before coming to Arkansas. So I came to Fayetteville in 71 for the Master of Fine Arts in Poetry, which I graduated. I have a degree in poetry. It doesn't really prepare you for much of a life uh, com commerce or success, but it did give me some writing skills. Uh, and then uh, one thing led to another. Um, a lot of my work um, has been in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I seem to have an ethic for social development and really helping people turn their inherent resources, their strength, their intelligence to a commercial success. Um, the story of the Tyson book is kind of a uh, shaggy, do shaggy dog story because there was a time when Sam Walton decided he wanted to create a CEO roundtable, a group called the Arkansas Business Council, sometimes called by John Brummett the Good Suit Club. You may not remember that. It was a, a, a late 80s. And these guys were meeting, and they, uh, these were the top CEOs of all the companies in Arkansas. So Tyson was there, J.B. Hunt, both Stevens brothers, Melvin Bell, um, Higginbotham with his uh, yogurt empire, Michael Ely Wilson, all the, all the richest men in Arkansas were in this room, and, and I was taking notes. And I was, so Sam was on the table, and I'm about 34 years old, and I'm sitting next to Sam Walton. This is before Bill Gates, and Sam is the richest man in the world, or in the U.S. anyway. One thing led to another, and I got to know Don Tyson through these series of meetings and would socialize with him. Don had a great zest for life, I like to say, well, as far as I'm going to go with that. He enjoyed people. Uh, so he would host a lot of events. Um, so I got to know him, and I was also at the same time publishing books with the University of Arkansas Press. And the director of the press was my former professor, Miller Williams, the poet. So the UA Press decided they wanted to do a series of books on Arkansas entrepreneurial companies. And they were a great selection of them. The first book was on Dillard's. The second book is on Tyson. The third is on J.B. Hunt. And there were plans to get the Walmart story and other corporate giants, all founded by Arkansans from the same generation. So the deal was cut with the Tyson Company that a book was going to be written about them. I got a call from Miller Williams said, we'd like you to write this book. I'd already written another book through the UA Press, so they knew what I could do. And I uh, came up to Fayetteville. I live in Little Rock. I came up to Fayetteville. There was an event for the UA Press, the fifth year anniversary. We were 
socializing. And I was sitting at uh, in the Hilton Hotel on the square in Fayetteville, and in comes Don Tyson, and he's in his khakis, and we share a drink, and we sh- shoot the breeze. And I said, uh, you know, by the way, the UA Press is going to write a book about the company. And he said, this is a classic CEO. He said, oh, yeah, I heard about that. I wonder who's writing it. I said, well, I'm writing it. <laughs> and here's the line. He said, that's fine as long as it has the right slant. The right slant. The right slant. <laughs> and I knew exactly what that meant. It was like, leave my lifestyle alone <laughs> and make sure, you know, it passes the review of our corporate PR, yeah. which it did. And, and, the, and the university press loved it. Tyson loved it. And that was 1990. I think it took him about a year, maybe two years, to write and produce the book. So um, I was given a kind of a carte blanche to uh, explore the company. The book has three uh, – It's a three-legged stool. There's a corporate history. There's a marketing study of the industry, poultry industry, and then there's a corporate biography. And, of course, the corporate biography is always the most interesting because there you see the real real workings of a genius. Uh, And and like Sam Walton and and, uh, J.B. Hunt and others who built empires from nothing, Uh, these are men and and women, too, who, who do it, of extraordinary intelligence and vision. So it's really a pleasure to work with them. I think that is unbelievable that you were able to like be in there and, and see that. That's that's history. That is uh, that is so fascinating. I, I did not know that that part. So what? Uh, before we get into Tyson, just like what what do you feel like is that biggest takeaway that you kind of saw? Was there was there something that really stood out about those you know titans of of Arkansas industry? Oh, there's a certain character that makes up a CEO personality, um, and they all all and men and women all have it. One is it's a leadership role. There's a willingness to take risks. There's a highly positive charisma to this person. You want to hang around with this person. Usually that founder CEO has a lieutenant who's got ice water in his veins, and they're the hatchet man to get the job done. There was a guy at J.B. Hahn said, I thought there would be a bomb in my car. I was every afternoon. I'm the guy that said, get those empty trucks rolling. And Leland Tollett who's a wonderful man, was the number two to Don Tyson. So every CEO has got a very um, appealing personality, uh, and they don't they'll, they'll sweat the details. They're not afraid to lose. They're willing to take risks, and they're very, uh, very progressive individuals. So they're really fun to be around. Yeah. Too cool. I, that's just, it's just fascinating so, all the way around. Uh, yeah, and I've had the uh, advantage – Opportunity to know quite a few of those Arkansas giants, um, Tyson Hunt, both Stevens brothers, Sam Walton, uh, Charlie Murphy. Um, all these guys were members of the Arkansas Business Council. Uh, even Rob Tyson, who's a little more reticent than his father. Um, I worked at the time, uh, my entry, I worked at the time for Axiom. So my boss was Charles Morgan. Morgan. He represented the young technology genius of wow. Arkansas. We're talking about late 80s, early 90s. And I was writing a lot of speeches for Morgan and doing a lot of corporate PR for Axiom at that time. So they brought me in to the CEO of the business roundtable to take notes. These guys were throwing out ideas. Every one of them had built an empire. They were throwing out ideas on how to improve the Arkansas workforce. Um, Archie Schaefer, you may know who he is. He was Dale Pumper's chief of staff. He was also behind the scenes. And Archie and I would sit through every meeting. The, the meetings were at the Poultry Federation, right down the street from the Capitol. Bill Clinton would come in, the governor at that time, schmooze, drink, talk, plan. Um, and the ideas were just flying out the room. And it was my job to kind of capture them, put them in a presentation so when the guys came back a week or two later, they said, okay, here's where we left off. Here's the good points. Here's the, here's the throwaway points. Where do you want to go with this? I, I cannot wait to visit with you more after this. All right, let's. Uh, that is just incredible one-on-one, first-hand accounts of some of, of the, the greatest impactors. Uh, that's just, I had no idea. You've kind of thrown me for a loop. It's too cool. <laughs> the book too I cool. wrote after Tyson was on J.B. Hunt. Okay, well. And I got to know him, and he was an extraordinary person. Unbelievable. Um, character and great great sense of humor great christian um but just uh loved loved gamble loved to take not shooting dice sure but business gamble he just loved to to take risks 
I love it. I love, I've heard a lot of great things. Uh, John L. is actually it, on my uncle's side. They're, they're related uh, somewhere in there. Yeah, he, they, they speak so. I don't know her, but they speak very highly. Okay, let's let's dive into to the Tyson startup. Like, how how they started was something that was really just out of kind of a, a necessity and opportunity that that what Don saw. So can you can you tell us about like the very very beginning early stages of sure. of how that started? So we start with Don's father, John Tyson, who was a classic Dust Bowl, um, well, Depression era farmer trucker. Uh, he stayed in Arkansas. I didn't go west with the, with the Okies. Uh, and he was ha- hauling hay. you got to remember Springdale and the, and the Ozark hilltops were pretty scrawny back in the 30s. You don't have the, the lush fields and fat Angus cattle that you do today, which is a result of decades of rice, of uh, chicken litter, rice holes and other organic matter, and phosphorus being spread out on these bare outcropping hills. It was pretty thin back then. Yeah. So John Tyson was either hauling hay or fruit from northwest Arkansas to mid-Missouri. And he had trucks. So he was basically a trucker. He knew that there was a market for live chickens in distant markets. That would be St. Louis and even further up north to Chicago. But the challenge was getting a bird or getting a live bird to those markets. The birds would not survive being in a crate on the back of a flatbed truck. So John Tyson and his entrepreneurial genius decided to build a flatbed truck platform where you could nail the crates in and then have a feed and watering system to go down the row of the crates and the birds would survive the journey to Chicago. And that's where he made his first money and he brought live birds to the market, first in St. Louis and then even further. The further you could take the birds, the greater the profit margin, the greater the risk. But he was able to, with a tarp and this watering system, he and his wife would drive the truck. And Don Tyson, baby Don, tells stories of sleeping in the bed on the foot, of the feet of the truck and growing up in those long rides. So Tyson, John Tyson Sr., made the initial runs. Uh, then he saw that there was um, opportunities to buy his own chicks. Uh, then there were opportunities to buy feed. Then there are opportunities to coordinate with growers. And he had a pretty solid business. But Don went to university. He was the first college graduate at the University of Arkansas, had a marketing degree. And he joined the company in the early 50s as a young man with a good education and a great sense of risk-taking. And it's because of his vision and the people that he brought in around him that the company just went into explosive growth became the world leader that we know today. So it's uh, he he took it the next the next right. step. So. But that uh, ingenuity and at a necessity and opportunities were were his dad. Then the word necessity is really key, Logan, because John Tyson tells the story that many other founding entrepreneurs they say I was down to my last nickel, and it literally was John Tyson. He went into a cafe in Springdale, threw down his last nickel, tried to make it seem like he had a big wad in his pocket, but he didn't know where he was going next. It was just a cup of coffee, and he was just going to figure it out. And maybe you and I would go hide our head in the sand and, you know, moan a bit. And, but this, this was a guy that faced adversity, raised his family in the Depression, and knew that work was going to win for him. I love that. It's, uh, you know, when you started talking about how the group came together and then all that they went to accomplish, it brings back the, uh, you know, show me your friends, I'll show you your future, or as iron sharpeth iron. It's just really, really interesting and and probably kind of uh, a reinforcer of like, it's important who you're (laughs) you're spending time with too, uh, to, to get maybe refined on skills and stuff. What, since, since you've published the book and since some time's gone by, how do you look back on that transition from the you know startup to the the more corporate model to the I mean you know almost like an institution that they are now that just it's just a conglomerate how how do you view the impact that they make now in in that transition from the end of the book till till today so the 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 marketing genius of the company in the years of its explosive growth was to anticipate the market, to know what was coming along. And that was a couple of factors. One was microwave, and the other was uh, uh, value-enhanced foods. 
prior to this growth era, let's say 60s and 70s, you bought a chicken as a whole unit, one dead bird. It was clean, but it was, that was it. You just bought the bird. And then you did all the work at home. Now, even before that, it was even more labor laborious with cleaning, et cetera. But what Tyson realized was that Americans wanted, we can call it fast food, we can call it value-added food. They wanted food that was moderately prepared so that it would reduce the time on the household. So they developed a market in response to the microwave industry. They developed a market response to the fast food restaurants such as KFC and uh, McDonald's and every fast food restaurant drive through that sells chickens. Tyson has an R&D kitchen dedicated to that company for their formulas, their innovations, their shapes, their colors. You want your chicken nugget to look like a dinosaur or a chicken? They could they can make it. You want to have a pepper flavor or a ginger flavor? They can do it. So they were responsive to, as I said, to, um, to the microwave, to the fast food drive throughs that just exploded in this country in the 60s and 70s, um, and then uh, make it easier on the consumer by uh, creating cut-up packaged foods. This is all normal now, yeah. how you go buy your chicken, but cutting up into select pieces, flavoring those pieces to a different degree, and then recognizing what parts of the bird are appealing to what cultures. So, for example, in the Asian cultures, far more interested in the dark meat portions of the bird. White Americans want the breast meat. Uh, chicken wings, um, buffalo wings were just coming in, so that became another factor. So recognizing these market-driven values, the company was able to shape its enormous production capacity to meet these goals. They just kept adapting, didn't they, just they, in the forecasting? They, they were they... very astute, very good observers of the American public what people wanted to eat and how they wanted to eat it, how they wanted to cook it. That's, uh, we, we recently visited with uh, Joel Salatin. Um, he's a regenerative farming you know, pioneer, but he talked about that convenience aspect that you, you brought up that they, they foresaw, and he was very reluctant to doing that. But he said, you know, just by simply going from, from a, a whole chicken to breaking it down a little bit, it was like the bottom line was almost instantly like twenty thousand uh, dollars for them, which you know a small operation is it's huge. Um, just that convenience is a big deal, and it's something that you know. Um, big takeaway that I am is how do, how do we build out this this local food system, and what can we take away from the lessons that have been uh, applied in, in other industries? And I think uh, a lot of times. You know, corporations get demonized uh, for for things, and I don't know that that's completely wrong. Uh, but I think that there's lessons to be learned everywhere. And so, Marvin, my my grandpa, I grew up around the chicken industry. Like my grandpa had uh, three broiler houses. I remember when they were built to every step. I have done everything in a chicken house <laughs> from you, a very young including age, including catching them, and, and catching them, feeding them, cleaning pans. Like I have done it all. Uh, all the the broken feed hoppers, it on and on and on. Yeah. But what, what uh, you know, I've seen is there's some struggles, like significant struggles. And I think that's what Shane and I, we want to, to he's who actually told me to get your book um, years ago, are going to talk about kind of that impact, like the, from, a, from the individual farmer, that local, you know, the hatcher, the feed operation, the catchers, the processing, the, the value added. You know, it is kind of a centralized uh, aspect. But what I want to kind of hit on from your perspective with the experience in workforce and the Delta and nonprofits, what what positives and maybe negatives have you seen from this centralization of agriculture? Well, we've come a long way, and Tyson's a pretty good example of that. <clears throat> There's some photos in the books of the early production lines, and uh, most of them were women. Uh, and they were standing on f uh, flats of cardboard to keep their feet dry because of all the water and waste pieces that were being swashed, washed down to a central drain. The scrawny, a line of scrawny birds, he looked pitiful on a conveyor, and they had to do things. Um, so working conditions have become a serious uh, recognition of uh, 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 decency for employees. Um, we have a much greater... Uh, uh, pieces in place to protect 
the worker, create a, a more wholesome environment, a safer, uh, healthier environment, both for the worker and the consumer. Um, that's an that's a enormous change. Um, environmental issues, you know, where does all this waste material, all the wash, all the water and the uh, internal parts of the chicken, there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, material that has to be addressed properly. Now, it used to be uh, very casually handled, and there were sludge ponds and just things that we wouldn't allow today. Uh, so you have labor issues, you have environmental issues, <clears throat> um, and then you have um, a corporate responsibility issues that I think uh, are good, good corporate citizens are recognizing that it's time to give back to the community. And something that's really admirable among the many Arkansas companies that came, their founding CEOs were Depression-era men. So we're looking at Dillard's and Hunt and uh, Melvin Bell and, and, and Tyson. They, in their later years, when they became uh, persons of significant wealth, were able to give back to the community. Um, and, and you can see what's happening in the Northwest in the Springdale and Rogers, um, even smaller companies like the Jones Truck Lines and, uh, and, and Pilgrims and others recognize they have a responsibility. Um, it's kind of a maturity, you know, like an individual. When you're a young person, you're, you're full of energy and strength, and you're building yourself and your career, and, and you're taking care of your family, and you get a little older, and you recognize your family's part of the community, and that community is part of a larger landscape, and you have an opportunity to make that better and make the world a little better than you found it. That's a, a very uh, significant ethic uh, we see in a lot of corporations that have matured. Corporations on the rise that are explosive, they've got a lot of work to do. They're not that settled yet, but they, they recognize that there's a value in giving back. I think I can't thank you enough for your, your perspective and, and taking the time to sit down. Where... Uh, where all is the book available? And I highly recommend everybody everybody check that out. So uh, Amazon or, or where where should we, we get that book? Yeah, Amazon will have it. Uh, University of Press has a catalog. They have it. It's in every bookstore, library. It's, uh, it's like I said, it was published in 1991. So it's been around a while, uh, pretty much uh, institutionalized. Um, you know, I'm gonna, can, if we have a moment, I'll tell you another story. Absolutely. How these – entrepreneurs and how these corporations overlap. And do you know how J.B. Hunt got involved here? Was it hauling chickens? No, 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 it wasn't hauling chickens. So J.B. Hunt is an itinerant truck driver. He comes down from Cleburne County. He's living in the YMCA on Broadway here in Little Rock. He's down to his last nickel. He's been trained as an auctioneer and it didn't work out, but he's now driving a truck for somebody, just driving all over Arkansas. And he's driving in um, past Stuttgart, and Riceland Foods is pushing out the rice holes from their processing, and they're burning these rice holes, piles of rice holes burning on the landscape. Everybody knows that rice holes make outstanding chicken litter. But the problem is you can fill a, a semi-trailer truck full of rice holes and have 20 pounds of fluff. You can't move the things. They're just too light. So J.B. Hunt, a sixth-grade school dropout, a, a son of a tenant farmer, a cotton picker, somehow sees or gets a hold of a pressure-driven packaging system, something that put ground black pepper in paper sacks. He changes it around to produce a rice hole packing device. He gets his own patent, puts a, a chicken on the cover, and then he doesn't just drive up to Springdale and sell packages of, of chicken litter. He sells shares in his new company. And he goes to George's and Tyson's and others and said, you contract with me and I'll deliver X number of chicken litter bags every year to you. And that's how he got into the trucking business. And that was a huge leap forward for the chicken companies because they had a steady supply, good, organic, clean uh, foundation to the, to the grow houses. It's fascinating. I had no idea that's how I got started. I got, I got to get your so book. So that's in the J.B. Hunt book. I'm getting your J.B. Hunt book, too. Well. Right. Marvin, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure, and I, I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed uh, visiting with you. Glad to do it. 
All right, so uh, just kind of set set up who who you are. Uh, one of one of my dear friends, uh, absolutely, uh, just ad- admire Shane. Have known him literally my entire life. Um, you, the, the kind of that history there is uh, you're a retired firefighter, pastor. You're a uh, restauranteur. You've been in the food service, you, especially yeah. especially Angela, yeah. right? Your wife in, in Clarksville, wonderful restaurant. But while we're here, is the main thing is like you're a, you're a chicken grower. You're oh. a broiler farmer for for Tyson, and I I actually grew up with that. Grandpa, you know, his my entire life had had these houses. Yeah. I remember building. I remember when you built them too. Uh, you know, I, I remember I was thinking about this the other day uh, when after the pads were done and then the the houses were built, we had to take the trailer and pick up rocks, all, mm-hmm. all the all oh, rocks yeah. to make yeah. it. I just remember I was probably yeah. five six years old doing that. But, anyways, we've talked a lot about kind of this regenerative movement, the difference between you know feeding the world, having a centralized system versus decentralized. And so wanted to just kind of you you said, "Hey, let's have a conversation and dive into the pros and cons, why why this will work, why that might not work." And uh just kind of an opportunity to, you know, you know, you you do, you know, have contracts for Tyson, so you defend yeah. them or or say, "Hey, these are some legitimate concerns." And and just an opportunity to see like how do we feel the future should go how, and what it's like, somebody that's wanting to be a part of the, you know, the food system, the prosperity of communities. So, um, Shane, with that, with that, uh, what, the, what, what are your thoughts on, on how we get, we get started? Well, um, first off, I think one thing that draws us together is we are not uh, either or type people. Uh, and I think that's a big problem with the world today. Uh, there is no compromise, and it's it's you've got to do it this way or you've got to do it that way. Uh, I do grow for Tyson. I have grown for Tyson for years now. Uh, I will tell you that as a contract poultry grower, uh, in my DNA, I am supposed to complain about my integrator. That's that's just what we do. You know, when and when you get chicken farmers together, they're going to complain. And I will say uh, right off the bat. There are things to complain about about our contracts. There, there are problems there that need to be worked out. I will also say this, though. Tyson rode in on a white horse when I grew for an integrator that shut the doors overnight. I was sitting on about six or $700,000 in debt. I have a high school education. I was not going to pay for that flipping burgers at McDonald's. And the Clarksville complex for Tyson... Uh, like I said, they rode in on a white horse, and they picked all of us up, and it was it was a, a big move. I think it's worked out good for us, and I think it's worked out good for them. Um, so while I have complaints about Tyson, it really irritates me uh, when when we're dealing with the people that are vehemently against uh, Tyson and uh, basically the the whole poultry system uh, altogether. I'm always amazed. We, I've grown for about 25 years now, so I've seen some changes. We start out with ConAgra. Actually, I think uh, uh, Gary was going to start out with ConAgra, and then there was some problems, and, and he wound up with Tyson right off the bat. But um, I've, I've watched a lot of changes. The two biggest changes that we have dealt with, besides technology aside, is dealing with the people that are on the no antibiotic ever movement and the animal welfare movement. And uh, those two things have been uh, a thorn, I think, in, in everybody's side. I don't know. Uh, I, uh, I will say this. For years, we abused antibiotics. When I grew for ConAgra, and I'm sure statute limitations up on this now, but when I grew for ConAgra, our service techs would pull up and we'd go, hey, our chickens were coughing a little bit last night, and they would pick up a tub of Aramice now the back of the truck, and they would sit on, we would run it through our medicators, and it works. It, it grows chickens. Um, years later, when we had got out of that, uh, I was watching TV, and I think it may have been Purdue, could have been Sanderson, but there was a, uh, their CEO was standing out in the field with some chickens roaming in the field, and uh, he was telling about how wonderful uh, their chicken was because there weren't antibiotics and there weren't hormones in it. That was a great sales pitch, but by that time, almost none of us had hormones or antibiotics in the chickens. They just used it. I had, I'd heard somebody say that Tyson has a great story to tell, and they're, lo- they're lousy at telling it, and, and that's true. I think that Tyson 
has always been behind the curve on that. So when the animal welfare people came in, um, actually I dealt with them first. I had one come in at, at when I was with Pilgrim Pride. And, you know, everything with them is absolute. Uh, she came in and, and she wanted to know if we had rat bait in our in our stations. And I said, well, yeah, we've got them in there. And I'm uh, an instigator. That's that's what I live for is to stir up hate and discontent. And uh, I said, yeah, we've got it in there, but why do we need it? And she said, well, she said, you've, you've got to, you know, you got to get rid of the rats. And I said, well, why do we need to get rid of the rats? And she said, well, they go in, they irritate chickens. She said, it's an animal welfare issue. I said, oh, no, it's not an animal welfare issue. If it's an animal welfare issue, we'd be worried about the rat too. It's a chicken welfare issue that you're worried about. And that's the problem because everybody has their thing that they're on, you know. I said, you're worried about that chicken, but I'm going to go in there and I'm going to put a poison in there that's going to cause that rat to hemorrhage from the inside out if the rat eats it. Now, that was another thing that I always found amusing. A rat is in the top 10 most intelligent animals in the world. Chickens don't even rank in the top 20. I don't know if they'd make it in the top 50. And I've seen some that wouldn't make it in the top 100. But, you know, that, that was their deal. They all have their, their little story that they get behind and then they just keep pushing, and it is a small, generally, a small, narrow group of people, and I'm going to say this, and this is going to cause trouble, but it's probably, it's usually a small, narrow group of people that really don't know what they're talking about. But they get a platform, and because they have a platform, Tyson and all the other people have to deal with them. Then you came down the pike, and I think it was McDonald's was the first one that got on the, the antibiotic deal, and... They, were, uh, they went to Tyson and all the integrators and said, well, we're not going to buy your chicken. Now, at that point, and again, this is operating from a 12th grade education level, but at that point, I would have got all the chicken companies together, which I know would have been an antitrust deal, but it would have not been the first time that the big companies had been involved in antitrust. But I would have got them all together, and I would have gone to all these fast food places, and I would have said, if you don't want our chicken, buy it from overseas. Because I promise you, if they're worried about the chicken that's coming from this country, they don't want it from other countries because there are no regulations over there. I mean, those people use antibiotics like there's no tomorrow. They're raised in filthy conditions. I, I'm, well, not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, tilapia is a good example. That is a very popular fish. If most people understood how that was raised, they wouldn't be eating it. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're not going to do it. But, but they, got, they got on the bandwagon, and then uh, our facility went to a no antibiotic ever facility. Now think about the implications of that right there. Because what it meant to us is we had gone from, from with ConAgra abusing antibiotics to then into the moderation of our field techs come out, they, they look at the bird, they cut the birds open, they find out what's wrong with them, and then they prescribe an antibiotic to them. They're given a particular amount of time. They are always withdrawn well within the withdrawal period for, for uh, food safety to nothing. So what that does is that puts it all on the grower. Every chicken that dies in there, and, and they're going to die by the 50s and hundreds and thousands sometime, but every chicken that dies in there, that grower has to pick up. That grower does not sell it. He's, he's had lost income. It's, it's a burden because there's a, there's a process of composting them, you know, and, and uh, so it, it becomes a burden on the grower. But it was all because you had these people that said, well, we don't want any antibiotic residue in our, in our chicken. Now, the thing that I found kind of strange about that is you were talking about a group of people now that everything had changed to the point to where mom and dad and the kids are getting home at night all at and, and somebody's going, what's for dinner? Now, 40 years ago, that would have never been a question because mom had been home all day long, and mom had probably gone to the grocery store on a Saturday and bought all the food for that week, and she could have told you on Sunday what was on dinner Thursday. But now we're making a last-minute decision. And so somebody says, well, we're going to go down and, and we're going to get some, some chicken from the deal. And mom says, well, would you take my car and fill it up with gas? And when you fill it up, Please use premium because if you use the cheaper stuff, it's not good for the motor. But we're going to go down and we're going to feed these kids some fast food that are growing, their brains are developing, their, their muscles, you know. Are the, we're not even worried about what we're feeding them. We just want them something. Tyson is not the problem. 
Tyson has answered a question, and the question overwhelmingly, and you know this from the American public, has been, what is the fastest and cheapest food I can feed my family? So they're sitting here, and, and, and this group, and I'm, I'm just saying moms, but they're sitting here, and they're worried to death that there might be some residual antibiotic in their chicken. That kid's getting up. They're pouring a bowl of Captain Crunch in front of him that has got an ingredient label that is that long that most of the words you cannot even pronounce. They're pouring a substance over it that started out as milk at some point but has been watered down from, from, from that point in the deal. And uh, then they're sending them with, with uh, Joe, the guy you interviewed there. That what, what's his name? Salison. Joe Salison. They're sending them with the Hot Pocket to school <laughs> and a fruit cup that's full of high fructose corn syrup. But the biggest worry they've got is they're terrified that there could be some residual antibiotic in that chicken. And it's because social media drives what people think. Nobody stops to think about it. These same moms will take their kids to the doctor and say, my kid's sick, I want a Z-Pack. I've seen it happen. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you know, you're I, on that. I think that we've absolutely got a broken system. I, I mean, just and, and I, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's not just extremely complex. Too. I think there's a lot, a lot of factors in there. Oh, it's hugely there, complex. Right? But... Um, yeah, the food system is broken uh, altogether, and that's kind of that was that's kind of what brought us here, right? With mm-hmm. Lander having cancer, is what I put in his body. I I want to know, right? And that's that's led me down to you know growing up in the chicken. Farm. I worked for a vet for you know Cargill. I've been in hog houses. Mm-hmm. I've worked it all. Like I, I understand that uh, from having you know my own farm and raising raising the animals uh, in in different manners. The food we eat matters so very, very much. And so we've got on one hand a system that's established. I mean, it is what it is. The the centralized, I mean, it is a centralized model that we have got with what, mm-hmm. and it's not Tyson. I, I, Tyson gets the brunt of it just because we're in Arkansas and, yeah. and it, that's who, you know, all of us <laughs> are very, very familiar with. But this centralized focus does exactly what you said. It's how do we produce the most efficient way how do we get it the uh, you know most cost effective way that consumers buy because it's consumer driven at the end of the day definitely Um, where where i want to see how we can take that next step and uh in in prepping for for talking to you uh read a a really eye-opening book on the whole antibiotic story uh big chicken so i highly recommend grabbing that one it's 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 really eye-opening because there's more more to it than i realized Mm -hmm. um and so that definitely highly recommend that one. But the the other the other aspect is is actually Sri Lanka. So as as out of left field as that may seem, they have a lot of problems, first of all. But one thing that they did you think? Yeah. One thing that they did was they tried to go uh organic uh overnight. They tried to go uh, regenerative overnight. And what it did uh was they they cut off all the inputs. Of, of the farm, and this mm-hmm. is, this has not just chicken, right? This is this is agriculture in general. They basically cut off all synthetic inputs, the way that it's running, right? Why it's mm-hmm. clicking, and the reason I bring that up is, is Shane, the, we shouldn't try to switch the system overnight. It would be a catastrophe, like what Sri Lanka is dealing with. But I still feel that we've got to get back to a a better way. How do we address that? There's going to be people that want the cheapest, fastest, easiest chicken ever. That's mm-hmm. not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying uh, an emphasis on that that model that is it, it's different and it's much, much more in line with nature and seasons and stuff. And, you know, maybe we shouldn't always have everything at all times. Well, first off, let me, and I think you can agree with me on this, there is no more organic. Nothing's organic. They can label it. They can put that on there. But but glyphosate has infiltrated every corner of the world. Yeah. And, we, we, uh, you know, Gabe Brown, we did an interview with him, and he dove into the whole greenwashing aspect yeah. of it. Uh, and, and that's a you know term that everybody should be familiar with. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, the glyphosate's another. That's a whole other uh, yeah. series in itself. But um, you're, you're dealing with, with um, when you get into looking at people's backgrounds, and statistics in America, about 50% of America lives on $50,000 or less per household. Now, in Joe Biden's economy, that is disastrous, you know. Um, They've got the average car payment, and this staggered my mind, 
The average new car payment is $700 stretched out over 70 months. The average used car payment is $546. The average mortgage is $2,800 a month. You throw in your cell phones, your plans, your all your subscriptions that are coming out of your bank account that you don't even know what they're going to. And people are, are on a pretty tight income. Um, there was 9 billion broilers produced last year in the United States. 17% of those were exported, so you've knocked that down to 7.5 billion <laughs> overall. That You're not going to have uh, Keith and Angela at Rabbit Ridge pick that up. You're, you're, I don't see uh, where you can ever assimilate all that into people that are raising them like them. Now, now do Keith and, and Angela do a good job? It's, it's amazing. I've been out there and watched them, but, but here's the difference. I go to their, uh, their place one night to eat. We're sitting there. There's a storm that starts coming through Atkins. I call my chicken houses. Uh, the, the computer has rolled up the inlets, opened the vent doors, shut fans down, Generator sitting by on standby if there's something happens and everything. Keith and them have to go down, physically roll curtains down on the on the their chicken tractors that they've got down there. Then when the front goes through, they have to roll them back up. They have to hand feed them. They're hand warm. They have to move those chicken tractors every day so they're on on new deal, new uh, pasture. Um, and do they have a better quality chicken than what I grow? And it's probably gonna blow some people up, but yeah. Yeah, they do. But here's the other thing. A whole chicken from them is $29, okay? Uh, that's about $6.5 a pound. A Tyson chicken is about a dollar and a half pound. I always joke that we provide an inexpensive uh, quality source of protein for little children, but it's really not a joke. I mean, we, we do. I know that every time there's a recall – all the world gets hysterical and everything, but the problem is NBC News is not there when your Aunt Nellie has poisoned a whole family with her potato salad. They are there when there's a problem with Tyson or Sanderson or anything about that. You cannot feed that many people that there's not going to be a glitch in the system every now and then. But people have spoken with their dollars, and they've said, we want the dollar and a half chicken. Uh, now, Keith and them, do, we've got... Uh, Full disclosure, we've got Keith and them trucked in our freezer right now. <laughs> their pork, their chicken, everything. And it is delicious. And they do an amazing job. They found a niche of people that have said that quality is the most important thing to me. And maybe I'm either wealthy enough that that doesn't make a difference or I made a conscious decision to cut some of this other stuff, you know, out of my life. And uh, uh, I think the problem is, is that most people, we don't understand, and, and hey, I'm as guilty of as anybody. I'm 60 years old, but I don't understand the sacrifice that my, my grandparents made. You know, my grandmother came up through the Depression. Uh, we just have a problem with either or. We want everything, you know. And in order to do that, we have got to have uh, that, that supplied, and in, in, it's got to be mass-produced, basically. Uh, I, I hear all the stuff about how awful our system is compared to everybody else's, you know, compared to the one that's out there in the pasture. I don't know, you know, they're, they're talking about how the chicken feels about it. I don't know that the chicken really has the ability to feel anything, you know. What I do know is we go into our houses, we clean them out, we put down fresh bedding, we run heaters for 24 hours until our floors are 90 degrees. That's what the chick wants. We come in there, we place them in there. From the time that chicken is placed in there, it has all the food it wants. It has all the water it wants. We run about a bird per square foot. It has the room it wants. We have environmental enrichment, which in our case is little tents that they can get under and, and run around because the animal welfare people want them to have environmental enrichment, <laughs> I guess. You know, I don't know. I don't, chicken tent. We, this is a new got, one for yeah, me, yeah, Shane. Yeah, I haven't yeah, been yeah, in there in yeah, a while, we, yeah, that, Well, it's, it, and I don't know that Darnell does it, but we do it. Uh, we have a, a contract with a company that that's important to them. So we put them out. It's not a big deal. We send them all out. But that bird, from the, from the day it's born until the day it leaves, has adequate feed, adequate water, Fantastic ventilation. We put amendments on the floor to stop any ammonia that might come up from there. 
and and that bird's got a pretty good life you know then it comes it gets on a truck they take it it is humanely killed and then packaged and goes to the consumer um I, I know Keith has a saying out there on his farm, and, and, and granted, a bird in the grass, that's probably a better life. Keith says our birds don't have but one bad day, you know, and, and, and he's right, you know. But it just, I just think they, everybody has got to where they've ragged on it. And I think Tyson is, uh, is easy to do because they're big, and people love to hate big corporations. But, you know, uh, Marvin, I mean, that book – when you consider in 1953, John Tyson goes up there and starts buying chickens and then says, well, I can hatch them and I can feed them and I can do all that and then grows into the, the company that it is today. I mean, that's a worldwide company, yeah. you know, uh, I think about 200,000 employees worldwide. Uh, I mean, they, they add a lot and they add a ton to Arkansas, the Arkansas economy. There's 2,400 poultry farms in Arkansas. You know, Reason. we produce about a billion pounds of broilers a year just in Arkansas. So, I mean, I, I just, I, I, like I said, there, I've, got, I've got problems with them. They're not perfect. They're a big company. But I think, what would we do without them if tomorrow, and I know you're not one of these people, but if the radical people in this movement could snap their finger tomorrow and eliminate them, what, what are you going to do? It would be a catastrophe. I mean, that's why I brought up Sri Lanka, right? Like, so the the economic impact, and, and that's that's where, you know, something that we have talked about and do not have a solution by any stretch. But it's like my grandpa's gotten to the point he wants to retire, right? Mm -hmm. He's finally got the chicken houses paid off. What does he do? He's what? wanting to keep growing because now he's wanting to make money. Well, he can make he can make more money because he doesn't mm -hmm. have the no. He doesn't want to keep growing, right? Yeah, because he's. He's tired. He wants to yeah. retire, right? And so there's like, what do you do? What do you do with the houses? So that's a, that's kind of a big thing is is you've got uh, a lot of people aren't in his position either, right? Carrying big notes on. Oh, it's it's it is uh, yes. There's it's hard to get paid out. It's it's hard to get paid out. So what do you do with the infrastructure? What do you do? How would uh, you know? Just think back to what you were saying when the the collapse of uh, was it Pilgrims that you mm -hmm. were with Pilgrims yeah. collapsed and then Tyson came in on on that white horse. What what would we do if we didn't have that? Uh, and something that uh, don't again don't have the answers, but like what we can't. And I have never. I, I'm not. I'm not a, a basher, right? Like I. I no, just want know. to do. I want to do the best we can. If my grandpa wanted to be able to convert the the houses into something else, uh, to be able to do that, or, or to be able to escape from yeah. the note. But like, if if you wanted to take a tangent, like what what could what could be done with these houses? What could be done with the the equipment that's there? Um, I, I just think that's an interesting conversation. But that economic impact of the jobs that it provides, what what do they do? You know, the money that a, oh, an employee yeah. of Tyson spends within a community. I think it's it's uh, absurd to try to change it overnight. Uh, but like, where where do we go? And I think there's uh, to answer that in short is we don't go anywhere <laughs> for a lot of it because it's yeah. not going away. That cheap yeah. uh, the product, the value added, the convenience, that's a, that's a huge part of the economy, and it's not going to go anywhere. But I think that we do need to give an emphasis to this the other side uh, because it matters a lot, especially on the health of the individual. Right? I, I, I'm, I don't you, – you brought up the, the taste earlier – but when you we start looking at the nutrient density, uh, there's not a comparison. I, I mean, there really isn't. Well, I, I I realize that they're they're more good fat, less bad fat on 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 Keith and Angela's chickens, and I'm just picking on them because I, we just buy their chickens, you know. But but uh, no, I I understand that, and and I don't know that there is a perfect solution, and I certainly don't know if there is a perfect solution to where we're at now in history. The perfect solution was. When our grandparents lived on a farm and they grew everything that they ate on that farm, are they traded with farms around them? But we're not going back to that, yeah. you know. So we've got to find some sort of a, a compromise, you know, in the whole deal. Um, you're talking about, you know, if, if, say, Gary wanted to stop and, and, and grow his own chickens by himself. I'm going to tell you, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. I, I grew up in a community, R.L. Singleton, was a independent contract turkey grower. That meant RL bought the turkeys, RL bought the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of feed. He absorbed 
all of the risk that Tyson absorbs now. That's, that's the big deal with us is that when, when corn goes through the roof, soybeans go through the roof, diesel goes through the roof, Tyson still pays us the same thing for those chickens. Now, when, when it's good, Tyson's making so much money they can bail it. But when it's bad, they weather that, and in general, it never comes back to the grower, you know. And, and that had to do with, with John W.'s, you know, uh, Dale Carnegie invented vertical integration. But I like to say John W. perfected it, you know. And, and, and it has worked to such a deal that they can, uh, they can weather the storms. And that's another thing. When people talk about, well, they're, they're making millions and billions of dollars. Yeah, they are. But, and I'm going to defend them now. And, and probably I'm even going to have some fellow growers that are not going to like this. They are making a lot of money. They do make a lot of money. But I worked for a company that didn't. And when they leave, it's bad because, like I said, we're all we're all sitting on these notes that, and it is, it's hard to get paid out of these. But we're sitting on all these notes, and really, we don't have another option to pay them. When you owe hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, you need that do it, and you need a company that is strong, you know, behind you to do it. Uh, I think that one thing that you do, uh, and people like you, when when there's a voice of reason. And y'all raise awareness. I think it helps your side. I'm and I'm on your side, but it, it helps your side, and and helps to to uh, incentivize people to come into it and to do what what Keith and Angela do and Joe and them. And I think you know what word I go back to is the the my side, so to speak. It's about creating a local system, right? Mm-hmm. Like I I I don't want one person to f- try to feed the world. I don't think that works. I don't want one company to try to feed the world. I want to see us get back to where you, you don't think we're going there. I'm actively trying to get us there. No, right? I, like, I, I, um, I want to see like what we do with Hoyne uh, and, you know, it's raised in Atkins, uh, our hometown. It's processed in Pottsville, less than mm-hmm. 10 miles away. It's brought to central Arkansas. That's 70 miles, right? So like 80 miles round trip is that food system, right? Till it gets to somebody's house or on a restaurant or, or at that's a big deal to me. And so as we were looking in this, I really was asking myself the question of should we eat chicken? Should we even be eating chicken, right? Because when we think well, about I'll it. Well, I'll kill you if I'll, you say we shouldn't <laughs> eat chicken. I mean, I don't even know what you're talking about. You what, when we look at that, that is, and I, I'm, I feel the same way about hogs, but it is such a large input, right? We have to grow the grain, with mm-hmm. soy, wheat, or corn, whatever whatever we're, that mix is. We have to grow it, then we have to you know, process it, then we have to turn it into feed, we have to transport it, and mm-hmm. then we have to bring it in. There's a huge input cost. And so that's where I, I go, should we? Is it even a healthy product? Uh, that's argument. But I do know unequivocally bone broth and eggs are superfoods, right? Mm-hmm. So, But when we're looking at that, it's the difference between a, a – what a, a broiler is now versus a backyard chicken, those aren't the same things anymore. Like, they're just not. Where we're looking at how do you utilize, and it just goes back to the, should we eat chicken, right? Like, that that's, it was kind of But when you, when you say that, or do you mean should we eat chicken that I'm growing <laughs> or should we eat chicken that Keith and Angela are growing or should we eat chicken at all? See, and that's what I was going through. Because that's, you're sounding like a crazy nutcase vegan right now. <laughs> yeah. So that that's exactly... My point, should we be eating the, the meat, right? Like, should that be a primary staple of Okay, now of I'm going to have to pull this card right now and everything. <laughs> this is coming from a carnivore? Yeah. But, I mean, but, but you, what, what not, would you do if you couldn't eat meat, though? I'm not saying meat. No, that's what you just said. No, you I'm just, saying chicken. Meat. Well, oh, chicken See, meat. Okay. Because, and okay. that's what I So you're for the beef. Yeah, I'm absolutely. That, which is, that which is the same thing as chicken, really. In conventional model, absolutely. Yeah. It is um, because it's the inputs. And that's where I was trying to break that down into these different kind of uh, buckets, these these different little silos of of a way to look at it. So when you look at uh, eggs, I, th- I sincerely think that they are a superfood. Yeah, I think I bone broth is an absolute superfood. These are ancestral foods that we have been eating forever. Yeah. Right? What we haven't been eating forever is the chicken, and, and it's it's uh, you know ra- what rabbit ridge or uh, white oak pastures or uh, I'm, I'm talking about everybody. I'm not saying uh, I think methods matter a lot, but I'm saying chicken, right? For meat, the broiler size, the the cob or, or the Cornish, whatever it is, 
if it requires large inputs, it doesn't contribute to this this uh, decentralized food system that I'm I'm talking about. And hogs take a lot of inputs. It's the mono it's the monoculture with the corn, soy, wheat. It, it doesn't matter. The ruminant what we're what I was getting back to on the beef. We don't have to have inputs. We really don't. We might have to have hay. Okay, so what 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 you're wanting to do <laughs> is uh, uh, basically in one fell swoop, you'd like to put all the row crop farmers out of out of business. Basically, and, uh, that's yeah. that's that's what I'm that getting out of this. That's what I was. no, I, I understand what you're saying. You're you're so you've eliminated all the fuel and 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 everything in in growing the corn and then transporting it and then processing it into feed. And then getting it to a chicken and feeding it, where you can just turn a cow out into a pasture. That is, uh, in in theory, I think that's great. the The problem is, uh, and you may know the answer to this. I certainly don't. But how much land does it take to do that? Because I have a, uh, I'm not, not a friend. Actually, hates my guts. But <laughs> I, I watch on on Stony Ridge Farmer. Yep, yep. we've talked about him before, yep. and and he does. He he won't even reply to any of my comments anymore. But he has 150 acres. He, he started a regenerative uh, farm, and they, they don't use chemicals. You'd love the guy. I mean, you know, uh, and, and, and it is. It's an impressive setup. Uh, they don't use chemicals. They, they roll their hay out. So what the cattle don't eat, they tramp into, trample into the ground, and they raise the carbon because it was a pretty poor farm when he started and everything. But he has 150 acres, and he can produce – as far as I understand him, a max of 50 head of cattle on that 150 acres. Per year? I, yes. For, for, so 50 head for processing y- per yes. year? Yes. And so, uh, well, you know what? I don't know that, Logan. He can support 50 head. I'm assuming, if we're assuming, you know, that all those are mama cows, he can, yeah, he can turn off one crop of calves a year on the deal. Uh, no antibiotics. He, he moves his cattle daily. So there is no worm load. There is no parasite load of any kind. There's, it, it is a super model, and, it is, uh, and, and every time I comment on it, I think he thinks I'm attacking him. I'm not attacking him. I'm just saying for the guy that's watching out there that's your age and says, I want to go do that, it's impossible. Yeah. From an economic standpoint, he cannot do that. Land is outrageous, you know. So I'm just wondering, now, if you're saying, well, we're going to turn all the row crop land back into pasture land, uh, and do that, that might be it. But I assume at some point somebody made a decision that they could make more money by growing corn on that land than they could by running cattle on it. Sure, and that, and that and goes down. Let me interrupt another. and say this. Food prices, and, and this is going to make people mad too, food prices are artificially low. Absolutely. And because they're artificially low, farmers don't make the money they ought to make, and so they have to make those decisions a- like that. Absolutely. Yeah, we're completely disconnected from the food. We are, um, indeed. We are. And I, I wasn't trying to bash the the big model, but I think there is absolutely some some downsides. And what what I am actively trying to fight for, right, is, is it's how do we get lower inputs where we're not reliant on the system. Yeah. Um, and this is it's not... It may it may be a utopian dream that absolutely never even co- comes close to fruition, but it's still what I would love to see happen because I think that that is communal prosperity. So when we talked to Marvin earlier about uh, th- that, that was what he was talking about when he, the delta is driving up, drying up, and that it that system it you know the tractors displaced uh, row croppers or mm-hmm. sharecroppers, and uh, it was that commodity system that's taking right it's yeah. taking the system i'm talking about is it, it keeps it within right we're not bringing in the inputs that take away from somewhere else and that we're reliant on but uh we we can graze it here we can process it here we consume it here right mm-hmm. and we feed the system and and just it's just closing that loop we're not we're not anywhere near getting there but it's just trying to have that conversation of and and, and the pros and, and cons of and wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about Tyson because I think that they, they do get a bad rap. They do. But there's a lot uh, there's a lot more to it. <laughs> there's a lot well, more. Well, I mean, it, it is. You, I mean, you can go down the rabbit hole all the way to the bottom of it. But as a whole, uh, and like I said, we are not in disagreement. I agree with you on almost everything you say. I just think that, that they do not get the credit they deserve for feeding as many people as they feed, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely.
Just look at Sri Lanka. <laughs> All right, Shane, thank you so much, brother. Uh, thank you. Appreciate you. We got we got a lot more to hash out. A lot. Yeah. A lot. And used to, we were friends, and now we're not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bubba. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Sewing Prosperity Podcast. We hope that you have learned something new and that you are inspired to adopt regenerative practices in your community. Remember that by working together, we can create a sustainable and abundant future for ourselves and for future generations.